Welcome back everybody and what I'm going to be doing today is doing a quick presentation on putting the context into my last video. So the last video I did was on the SS survival pouch by Lofty Wiseman and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about how that pouch fits in with all the rest of the SF soldiers kit um, where it sits and clear up a little bit of the confusion that people were having um, thinking that that was like a standalone um, EDC kit or survival kit. It's not so what I'll talk about is the context in which that fits in the soldier's gear. So then, the first line in an SF soldier's kit is what he's wearing and what he's got in his pockets. Okay, So you can have things like a notebook and pens, so you can have a compass, you can have your escape map, possibly escape money. Uh, you could also potentially be carrying your survival kit within your pocket as well. So that's just some of the items that a soldier would be carrying on his first line. I'm not going to go through all that because that's fairly basic anyway, and I have actually covered that in one of my other videos. Okay then, so what we've got here is a set of SAS belt kit as worn in the sort of 1970s, 1980s. This is the sort of gear that Lofty Wiseman and, you know, his Mucka G's would have been wearing around this sort of time, okay, during that era. Um, you could probably notice it's made up of the older style canvas webbing material, which obviously isn't brilliant. It's, it's, you know, it's older technology now. It tends to soak up the water a bit. It tends to um, restrict in, you know, shrink a bit when it's wet. So not brilliant, but obviously what we're talking about here is sort of 1960s, 1970s uh, gear, that sort of technology before nylon came in. So what I'll do is I'll talk through the belt kit um, what sort of gear was carried obviously this is just an average you know each soldier will have their own take on what kit they'd prioritize what they'd rather carry what they wouldn't carry but a lot of it would be SOP as well um, so what I'm going to do is just put into context that center pouch there which was the SS survival pouch that I covered in my last video in and amongst everything else okay so the belt there then that's actually a riggers belt so that's um, that's taken from uh, a piece of material that's taken off a harness, a parachute harness, for rigging up supplies for supply drops. And quite often these will be taken off and used because it's got a quick release roll buckle on um, and it's easy to adjust on the move, okay? You've then got, going from left to right, you've got ammo pouches there. These are specifically made for M16 Armour Light magazines. You can see they're quite small, they're the 20 round magazine type that they had during that era. So you'd have two magazines in each of those, so four magazines, and you can see that they're on low hanging belt loops. And the idea for that is so that when you've got a heavy rucksack on your, on your back, that the, uh, the pouches aren't interfering with the, uh, the rucksack itself. Going along from there then, you've got a water bottle, obviously very important to carry lots of water on your body. And this is an old 44 pattern water bottle pouch. In there, I've got a 58, a normal standard 58 water bottle, and then underneath that then is the old metal mug. Um, and obviously that could be used for cooking your food in, getting a brew on, stuff like that. So a very important bit of kit. Next one then is the SES survival pouch itself, and I won't go into the contents of that. I've cut that in uh, great detail in my previous video, and I'll put a link onto it here. But basically what that is, is signaling equipment, um, some emergency rations, some brew kit, and your cooker. Um, so bits and pieces like that, but as I said, I've covered that in detail in a previous video. Going along then, the next pouch along, this is another 44 water bottle pouch. And yeah, you can carry another water bottle in there. But in this one then, what I've got is firstly just a set of gloves. So a pair of gloves that a soldier would be using for, you know, getting through the brush and stuff in the jungle, uh, protecting his hands. Um, also, when operating a weapon, it's a good idea to be wearing a set of gloves to protect yourself from burns, things like on a on a GPMG or something, or an LMG, it's a good idea to be wearing a set of gloves. Um, next thing out of this pouch then, is the survival tin. So this is actually the survival tin that I carry for a long time while serving, and it's well packed. I'll go through this in another video, in another follow-up video. You can see it's got a thermal blanket there and a couple of ranger bands holding that in place. But this is where all your actual survival kit would actually be. So your fishing kit, your snares, your water purification, you know, your small little knife, all those little bits and pieces are held in there rather than in that, that pouch in there, okay? So just to clear up that little bit of confusion from the previous video, this isn't a standalone survival kit, that's a supplementary kit 
for you know your sear your e and e um this tin here then this is actually from a, a dems kit uh, it was for grip switches for you know for dems for blowing stuff up basically for those that don't know what dems is um and the reason why we use those more than the, the little tobacco tins is they're slightly bigger and a little bit more robust so that's the survival tin there also in this pouch then what i've got is 24 hours worth of rations there so we've got a couple of boiling the bags um some survival sort of rations there and a brew kit okay so that's all good to go and that wouldn't be touched unless you've absolutely needed to so if you went on the run with only your belt kit on you couldn't you know grab your bergen for whatever reason for mobility issues whatever you need to move quickly then that is literally just for survival just for you know last minute.com type stuff also in this pouch then what i've got is a mill bank bag okay and what this is for this is for filtrating water so you basically put dirty water in there and it drips out the bottom into your your container so into your mug or whatever you've got then that that will filter the water uh, and Out outdoor basics actually did a really good video on the use of those so I, I won't cover that here there, there is plenty of videos out there but um you know a good bit of kit and they were they were army issue though so you would find that quite a few of the guys would be carrying those it'd probably be an sop actually okay next pouch along then what i've got in here this is the med pouch so what i've got is a trauma kit and what i've got is just a, i've got like an insert that used to be carried in the, the side pouch of the med kits and that just pulls straight out it's like a little mesh pouch um and inside here i've got two israeli bandages and two tourniquets there one there and one there all right now you know med kit it's very much an individual thing but also within the military we do have sops standard operating procedures and this is the sort of thing we've carried also you know possibly carry airways and stuff like that but this is just a, a basic trauma kit there and that's sitting in that pouch there going along from that then you've got more ammunition pouches so another four magazines over this side totaling eight magazines total obviously depending on the type of operation that the guys are going on that would depend on how much ammunition they carry on the belt kit in the belt kit or potentially in the grab bag on their back as well they might even have bandoliers as well um, but this would be sort of a relatively standard loadout for a soldier on the move um, what we've got at the bottom here then you've got a parang so this is a, a machete that's made over in uh, Brunei. I bought this when I was on the Jungle Warfare Instructor course. So it's kind of a bit more handier and um, a bit better than the, the Army Issue machete. So you see the, the shape of the blade there, it's kind of curved. So that was made by the IBAN over in um, Brunei. And I've got a little, um, a little sheath made up for it out of um, DPM material there. You notice this isn't attached to the belt. And the reason why that is, is because normal SOPs in the British Army, at least in the jungle, is you have this tied around your waist. So I've got a waistband there, a strap, and that would actually be carried around the waist at all times if you were in the jungle, um, because this is a survival tool. So it'd be on your body, you'd never take it off. Um, whereas, you know, with your, with your webbing, you do have to take it off once in a while, you know, if you're getting in, in your hammock and going to sleep or whatever. Whereas this would stay on you at all times. So in an emergency you've got that with you um, so that's why it's not in the belt obviously a soldier may want to carry a survival knife or whatever of some sort again either on the body or on the belt but this is just sort of an average picture of a of a loadout of a special forces soldier for the 1970s and 1980s right then so i've covered the soldier's first line what he carries in his pockets to survive from i've covered what the soldier will carry in his belt kit or fighting order that's what he's going to fight with and what I'm going to cover now is the third line. Okay, so this is an SAS Para Bergen. This is where the soldier would carry all his personal gear and patrol kit. Okay, so these rucksacks, this is an SAS Para Bergen, this is an original one. These were designed in the early 1970s. And the reason why these came about is before this, in the British Army, all that they had for Special Forces and Airborne Forces was the old canvas rucksacks from World War II which were okay at the time in the 1940s, but you know, as time went on, they, they become kind of obsolete. 
And as a result of fighting in uh, Malaya and Borneo, then Special Forces put in a requirement for a bigger, heavier rucksack. And this is the result of that. So this was made out of nylon, which is a better material, especially in the jungle where it's you know, going to be raining all the time and stuff. The old cotton uh, Second World War rucksacks obviously didn't fare too well in those kind of conditions. So what did the soldier carry within his rucksack then, his Bergen rucksack? So within this, you've got everything you need to live. So you're going to have your sleeping bag, you're going to have some sort of roll mat, potentially a hammock if you're in the jungle. You're going to have your basher or poncho, so your shelter. Then on top of that, you're going to have all your food. So you could be on the ground for anything up to two weeks or even longer. So you're going to have to be carrying a lot of rations. Water, so additional water on top of what you've got in your belt kit. All your own personal gear. Plus, on top of that, it depends on what the, the role is of the, the soldier within a patrol, uh, you're also going to be carrying what's called patrol kit, okay? So an SAS patrol would typically be made up of a four-man team. You'd have a lead scout that'd be carrying demolitions kit. You'd have the patrol commander who would be carrying OP kit, observation kit, stuff like that. You'd have a radio operator, obviously carrying a radio. Uh, and back in the 70s, they'd have a big old heavy radio. Uh, and then the last man would be the medic, so he'd be carrying a team med kit, which is obviously a big old um, set of medical kit for the entire patrol, because he had to sustain any kind of casualties that happened whilst they was out on the ground, um, you know, right up until they actually get Kazabak, which could be quite a long time, depending on where they are and what they're doing. On top of that, obviously, each, each soldier could be carrying support weapons ammo, so things like mortar rounds, link ammunition for a GPMG or a... LMG uh, ammunition um, and then stuff like radio batteries and all that on top of that so within this kit it could be anything up to you know over a hundred pound that's in this rucksack here and that's a lot of gear that the guy's carrying okay now looking at the design of the rucksack then you can see it's relatively basic you've got a couple of external pouches this one here would be good for putting your basher in because it keeps you know your wet um, shelter away from all the internal parts of your kit you potentially put rations in a side pouch you know it's up to the individual you can see here that it's actually just tied on there's like two pieces of nylon kind of cord or rope and it's just tied up so it's quite basic and then looking at the, the other side of the bergen that's against your back then now this is fa fairly basic isn't it you've got two straps there no chest strap at all and no waist strap um, you've got quite a sturdy metal frame there um, and you can see the whole con construction in the Bergen is pretty you know pretty hefty pretty bomb proof so it was built to withstand some hard use only thing is this here against your back does actually it can actually um, hurt quite a bit and I've got quite a bit of experience of that when I went through basic training for the parachute regiment this is what we carried through depot um, had about a year's worth of carrying one of these and we were tabbing, that's speed marching, just about every day. Um, so I joined as a junior soldier when I was 16, did six month training and did another six month training carrying one of these. And basically this stuff here, the nylon, does tend to wreck your back quite a bit. You do kind of get what we used to call Bergen burns. So friction burns against your back where this stuff is bouncing up and down on your back because you haven't got the stability of a waist strap or you know a chest strap. Um, so not ideal, but at the time that these were designed they were actually pretty cutting edge to be fair and some of the american people watching this will probably notice it's relatively similar to the old alice pack it's not the same by any means but you can see it's got a very similar sort of design where it's made out of nylon it's got the external pouches and an external frame so this is the line we went down um, as opposed to the alice pack and to be fair i've had a bit of experience in carrying both and I do prefer this one. It, it is a little bit more robust and it actually gives you a bit more, um, I'd say, carrying capability. It's, it's a bit more sturdy and it, it, it helps carry the load on your back a little bit better than an Alice pack. But um, yeah, good bit of kit for when it came out. A little bit old, a bit long in the tooth now though. So that was just a quick talk through the personal kit carried by a Special Forces soldier in the 1970s, 1980s. Like I say, what I want to do is put into context that SAS survival pouch from my previous video and you know, make people kind of understand where it fitted 
in and amongst the rest of the soldier's gear. It wasn't designed to be a standalone EDC pouch or even a survival kit itself. It's just like a supplementary bit of kit, more for escape and evasion than actual survival itself. Uh, anyway, let, let me know what you think about this kit in the comments. Obviously, things have changed over the years. Things have you know moved on, they've evolved. But a lot of that stuff is actually really quite relevant to the modern soldier. It's just how it's carried, you know, kits moved on, kits got better and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, obviously I've got a lot of experience in this sort of thing myself and I'm a little bit of a kit pest. So this is kind of a little bit of a, an interesting for me too. Um, anyway, yeah, put your comments in the section below. Thanks for all your likes, shares and subscriptions. Uh, over 2,000 uh, subs now. So thanks very much for that. I appreciate it. And don't forget, stay prepared.